Is it possible for two engines of an airplane to fail at the same time? What are the odds of that? And how in the world could that happen? So ever since day one of this incident, people have been changing the root cause analysis of this. And they seem to change their mind according to the prevailing winds or what two words they hear a certain YouTuber throw out there. So on the first day, of course, it was pilot error. And then it was the wing flaps. They weren't extended. They were extended. They didn't retract. They did retract. And, you know, a number of people came here and left angry comments to me. Are you stupid? Don't you see the flaps weren't set right? And I'm like, no, and neither can you. Because nobody can tell, really, with 100% certainty from that video at all. So there seems to be a different flavor every day. And so today's root cause du jour, folks, is, I bet you guessed it already, vapor lock. So what happens is, uh, of course, people hear one influencer on another channel say something or mention two words in passing, and they go, oh, that's it. It's vapor lock. And then they start running in droves to channels like this here to be the first one in the comments to write it down there, vapor lock. So we got hit with boatloads of people mentioning that. So here you can see right here, vapor lock. Many pilots are now waiting for your video. Vapor lock will be your next analysis. I need more information about the fuel delivery system. I'm still going with fuel, a vapor lock or contaminated fuel. That's another one that I've heard quite a bit. Um, here's another one. How about issue of vaporizing fuel? And uh, I guess this is the YouTuber that started it all. So you should check out Meet Kevin's channel. He's got a great channel. And on there, I guess he must have been the first one to mention this whole thing about vapor lock a few days ago. And then everybody, of course, started following suit on that. Just because you hear two words mentioned, that doesn't mean that's the root cause. And I doubt that he even thinks it's the root cause. But so many people are asking me, what is vapor lock? Yeah. So vapor lock in your engine is when your liquid fuel is brought into the engine and it's atomized and then it is in the combustion chamber, it's combusted. And so in order for the pump to keep going, it needs to be pumping liquid. It needs to suck it in and then send it off and then it combusts. Well, what happens is somehow the gasoline turns into vapor and you get this condition known as vapor lock where the pump has nothing to pump. So that's basically it in a nutshell. You've probably seen this many times if you've ever rented a pressure washer before. And in fact, just a month ago, I uploaded a video on how to pressure clean your paver brick driveway. And I showed you the rookie mistakes that a lot of people make with their pressure washer. And one of them is to make sure that your garden hose where it's connected, that the water is on at the hose bib. The water has to be flowing for your pressure washer to start to allow some of that low pressure water to work its way all the way out the nozzles and get all of the air out of the system. So here I am simulating here what it looks like when you don't turn on the garden hose. You're going to sit there and be pulling that cord. And if not, you're going to be sitting there pulling that chain all day long till the cows come home and that engine will never start because that pressure switch in there is looking for that water pressure from the garden hose. And if it doesn't see that liquid, then it's not going to start. So it's a similar type thing to what we were talking about with, with vapor lock. Only here, there's no vapor. There's just no liquid. That's the, the main problem here, is that you don't have liquid going into the engine like it should be. So you see, folks, how people hear two little words and think they know everything about the subject. But the, the reality here is that vapor lock is only an issue for smaller planes with smaller engines. It is not really an issue for these larger planes like the Boeing 787-8, especially if they're using Jet A1 fuel, which is already a resistant to high temperature fuel. And also the 787's fuel system has redundant pumps, sensors, and thermal management. So it's not likely with all of this backup that you would have any kind of vapor forming in there. And remember, they keep the fuel in there under a very high pressure. So it's not likely to allow any air bubbles in there to develop or get any type of fumes going. And I also don't think that it was contaminated fuel like many other people are hypothesizing. And my reason behind that is a couple of reasons. Number one, they have really good filters and sensors in place that would capture any type of contamination and alert them. And second of all, other planes were using that same fuel from that airport and none of them had any problems. And just as a, a note here, I just wanted to remind all of you, nowhere anywhere have I said any definite root cause yet. So a lot of people keep coming in here and arguing with me in the comments saying, how can you say density altitude caused this? I'm like, I didn't. I said it could have been a, a contributing factor 
And density altitude is not a problem with most of these planes because it's all taken care of in their computers. You enter the information and it calculates the amount of runway you need, the thrust, all of that stuff. And so it's not a problem for normal planes. It's only a problem if your engine has a problem or if you entered wrong data, then the density altitude is a problem. So now the other prevailing theory that you're hearing some of the other channels talk about now is dual engine failure. So how does two engines on an incredible plane that has had zero major mishaps, uh, the Boeing 787 is probably their safest plane to date. So how do you have two engines that fail at the exact same time? What are even the odds of that? So let's take a look at this. So I made this slide here to show you. So for flight 171, um, the industry reported engine failure rate is uh, right here. It's known as the IFSD. And the rate for modern engines like uh, the GE, the engine that's on there right now, is this. So it's 0.02 per 1,000 engine flight hours, equivalent to 2 times 10 to the minus 5th per hour. So just remember this number I'm going to show you on the next slide here. So this means that one engine fails approximately once every 50,000 hours of operation. And this whole concept is very similar to when we used to buy hard drives, and you used to look on the little charts for your hard drive, and it would tell you mean time between failure. It's a very similar concept. So right here, um, if both of the engines fail, and I'm assuming independently, the joint probability of both of them failing at, during this same hour is this. So here's your formula. Your probability of dual failure equals probability that engine one fails times the probability that engine two fails. And so when we multiply those two, you end up with four times 10 to the minus 10th, which gives you a one in 2.5 billion chance of both engines failing in the same hour independently. As you can see here, you are more likely to win the Powerball then you are to have a dual engine failure. So of course you are more likely to win the Powerball and those odds are here. And so the Powerball odds are one in 292 million, which are a lot better chance of that happening than getting two engines to fail at the same time. So right now I'm leaning more towards the engines had a thrust issue of some sort, or maybe the power system controlling the engines, telling the engines what to do might have failed. I'm not sure that we had that condition of both engines just failing at the same time. The odds of that happening are just off the charts. One thing we do know was they did have enough thrust to hit that VR and the V1 and they went nose up and they got off the ground and it looked pretty normal until it didn't look normal. So apparently at some point in time, and I think this is probably between two and eight seconds after the plane lifted off of the runway, is likely when whatever issue they had occurred. Maybe it was a hydraulics issue or the power issue. So let's say I'm wrong and maybe it was the two engines that failed. What could possibly make these two engines, both of them, fail? Let's take a look. Okay, so I made this chart here to analyze what may have caused this dual engine failure here. And one of them, of course, the fuel contaminant or mismanagement. So we, we talked about that, and I don't think that that's an issue. Um, it is, it's a very slight chance, but probably not. Bird ingestion, I hear a lot of people saying that, oh, it was bird strike, that was it. But no, we saw no evidence of that. And I thought I, I saw a couple of reports that said that they already looked at the runway and didn't see any evidence of birds there. And you would have seen it on those videos anyway. If it took out both engines, they would have had to fly through a large group of birds. Um, then, of course, we got to satisfy the conspiracy theory people. So you have sabotage or just simply human error. So far, we've ruled out, I think, pilot error for now, unless some other evidence comes up. As far as sabotage, uh, some people have asked me, could anybody have remotely controlled this plane and brought it down? And I doubt that is the case. You would have to speak to a 787 pilot about that to ask, like, what other inroads are there into that computer? But I think everything has to be entered by hand. Now, the other one up here is severe weather or foreign material. Well, there was no severe weather at all there, no volcano ash or anything. And um, But foreign material, yeah, something could have, like, maybe blown up in, into the air right in front of the engines. But again, if it had hit the engines and gotten in there, they might have started smoking and flaming out, and you would have seen that. I mean, they, they looked perfectly clean. 
Uh, another one here would be the electrical system fault. And uh, of course, then you have fire, smoke, or overheat trigger, like maybe something uh, had a little bit too much current going and caused something to overheat. Now, in terms of the electrical system, let's take a look at this. So you may have heard other people talking about this here. This is the bay deck. So now, if the problem is in the electrical system, one of the big components here for the engine is called the FADEC. So this is the full authority digital engine control. So this is kind of like the ECM modules in our cars that, that control everything related to our engines. And it just takes the input from the accelerator and tells the engine what to do. It's a it's part of a complex system here. Now this is usually attached to the engine. And so on a typical plane engine, this would be the FADEC right here. And also, they're usually redundant, so they have a left side and a right side in some cases. Yeah, so I would think that in the Dreamliner here from Boeing, that it's likely also has a redundant circuit in there. Now, these are circuit boards just like any other computer, and something could happen to a chip on there. And the, But if something happens to the chip, then something could happen to the engine. But remember, there's one in each engine, so both of these would have to fail at the same time. So it's really getting complex now trying to determine what could have caused both of these engines to either stop or drop thrust at the same time and if it was a hydraulic issue well here's the hydraulic system for the 787 and there's a left system and a center system and a right system so they're all separate but yet it looks like you had multiple failures across all three of these if there was a hydraulic system they all would have had to have shut down most likely so hopefully the investigators will be able to tell us what was the actual cause and if you didn't see my video from here on the Air India crash, check it out right up here. And make sure you also check out my other video that I did on the Boca Raton airplane crash right here. And it was special to me personally because it happened local to me. I was able to go to the scene and shoot video there. So thank you so much for joining us. And we'll see all of you on the next one.